You're listening to the SSPX Podcast, and welcome to Episode 5 of the Crisis in the Church series. This week, we're again welcoming Father Stephen Reuter. We'll be learning more about liberalism through the eyes of one of the great pontiffs of the last two centuries, Pope Leo XIII, and his condemnation of liberalism in Libertas. We'll also learn more about Cardinal Bilo, who was outspoken about liberalism, and before 2020, was the last cardinal to resign his position. Related to that, we'll discover why 1927 was such a fascinating year in the eternal city of Rome. If you'd like to go back and revisit some of our earlier episodes, find out more about this series on the crisis in the church, or find out how to support this project, please visit sspxpodcast.com. Now, we'll turn to our conversation with Father Reuter. Well, Father Reuter, welcome back to another episode of the SSPX Podcast. And now we are on our second part of liberalism with you. Yeah, I wanted to recap a little bit from last week. Sure. And then analyze a bit of Leo the Thirteenth encyclical on liberalism and Catholicism. But then in a final podcast, really focus on liberal Catholicism as such and see how liberalism got into the church. Okay. Uh, Leo the Thirteenth, obviously Pope St. Pius the Tenth combated liberalism, modernism mm-hmm. uh, as well. Uh, but Leo XIII, at the end of the 19th century, he's the one who really started to take on these these modern errors. Um, and frankly, if, if you can say that one pope is your favorite versus another pope, Leo XIII is way up there in my book. Uh, personally, I, I love reading his uh, his writings. To me, they're so clear, and, and he was able to take, yeah. those, uh, take the principles and, and apply them to modern life. Um, but who was the encyclicals? They were very clear. He was really the light of the last century for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Course, Pope St. Pius X is Pope St. Pius X. So it's hard to draw the comparison as far as the great saint of the last century. But the previous century, the great light was Leo the Thirteenth. And in fact, what people often don't know is as uh, before he was Pope, as Cardinal, he was very influential mm-hmm. in the syllabus of errors which was actually published and promulgated with Quanticura Pius IX. But mm. in fact, Leo XIII, as Cardinal Pecci, who was really pushing forward that, that syllabus because he recognized that the minds of people were being so indoctrinated by error that we needed a clear synthesis which condemned you know, the worst errors of the modern world. And so he was the chief force behind that syllabus of errors and by which the church did condemn in a very powerful and definitive way, you know, the 80 errors you know, upon which the modern world is really built. 80? 80. 80, yeah. Wow. So he, he compiled, compiled these errors and, and kind of like what St. Thomas Aquinas... Yes. And, and one and of he, the... So, go ahead, sorry. It's one of the theologians who really pushed the project forward and compiled these errors, which then Pius IX published. I see. All right. So um, you were mentioning you're mentioning to me before. You know, it, it may even be good for us to read to know about some of these errors in order to understand. You know how the church has combated them. Uh, like I was going to say, kind of like how Saint Thomas Aquinas did when he goes through the Summa Theologica. You know, he gives the objection and then says, "All right, well, here's the actual truth." Yes, in fact, a very good test to see how influenced we are by the modern world is, in fact, to read through the syllabus and just see if those propositions stand out as something which is true or something which should be condemned. Absolutely. It's kind of like one of those quizzes you might take online. Well, if you agree with this and your score is high, uh (laughs) uh-oh. It's something like that. Um, So liberalism, we're talking about liberalism, and the title of the encyclical from Pope Leo XIII that we're talking about uh, that we're starting out with is libertas. Um, Same root word, same, same, uh, same thing, right? Exactly, because liberalism is an, er, is an error by which liberty is abused. Okay. So he's condemning the abuse of true liberty. So we can't understand the abuse unless we understand what true liberty is. Right, okay. So what does Pope Leo XIII say that liberty is? Well, we'll give a few quotes from, we'll begin with libertas and give us some, a few quotations. He tells us that that liberty is the highest of natural endowments given only to the intellectual or rational natures and confers on them this dignity 
that man is in the hands of his own counsel. So man is in the hands of his own counsel. He has the power over his own actions, which of course is to just quite simply say, man has free will. This free will gives man the ability to choose between particular goods. And this free will gives man a dignity. We can say the root of his dignity is in the fact that he has an intellect and will by which he can know the truth and choose that which is good. So the root of man's dignity is his rational soul from which flows his free will. And, and that is absolutely distinct from, from any other animal. No other animal has, has this free will. So, so that's what makes us uh, really distinct. And that's probably, uh, I'm probably getting into a lot of different sorts of theology and metaphysics here that I'm not uh, able to do, but um, basically that is a function of having a soul. Having an eternal soul kind of means you have free will. Exactly. It's because we have an immaterial, simple soul created by God, distinct from the body, that we're able to choose freely certain goods and leave behind other goods. And in the, we'll see later the abuse of liberty is also the ability to choose evil, which right. will be, as we'll see, an abuse. And the church is always, you know, from we see St. Augustine, when he left the Manichaean heresy and fighting the Manichaeans, we see the popes in condemning Jansenism and the reformers. The church has always been a very, very staunch defender of the fact that man. Uh, you say that the church has always defended free will, but people always say that the church is hostile to people being free and people having having uh, liberty. Um, she, the church seems to forbid things and command things all the time. You can't do this, you can't do this. And I'm taking the opposite position here. The, the church has always been a defender of liberty. Um, and, and it's, again, not true that, that the church has been an enemy of liberty. Exactly. No, the church, from the beginning, and Leo the Thirteenth makes it clear that the church has always defended human liberty with unequaled constancy as a dogma of the faith. The church is very clear that man is created with a, with a spiritual soul, and man has free will. So the church has done that since the beginning, and she does it, of course, because the church loves the truth and teaches the truth with great clarity. And it was certainly the hallmark of the pre-conciliar church, we can say, to always be very, very clear. You know, the hallmark of the post-conciliar church is really ambiguity. You know, we're never right. quite sure what the documents are saying. And ambiguity is from the devil. It's, it causes great havoc in minds of people. Okay. So free will, Pope Leo XIII equates free will or also calls it natural liberty. Can you explain that a little bit? It flows from the fact that we have human nature. Okay. It's the fountain of all of our other liberties. If we did not have the ability to choose, we would not have the ability to, to choose within the moral law or to exit the moral law by disobeying the commandments. So it's a faculty which gives us a dignity and allows us to be master of our actions. That's what free will is. It's, it comes to us with nature, it's a faculty, and it's ordained towards the good. God gave us a will so that we could freely choose that which is good. So the object of our will is the good as universally understood. And then we can make choices by which we choose this or that particular good for the sake of our ultimate good. Okay. The, the objection that people always make, and this is probably similar to, you know, why does God allow evil if he's all good? But how is it that we have been made, created to be able to choose evil? Uh, if, we've, if our entire purpose is to mm -hmm. serve God and, and to know him and love him forever, how is it we can choose evil if we're, we've been made to do good? Yes, there's a few things there. One is we have to say that God wanted to create a, a moral universe where people could freely love him and people would freely love him. That's what he wants. But to get down to your exact question, we'll look at a little bit of psychology. So the, the will is a faculty by which we choose in the same way the, you know, the ear is a faculty by which we hear the eye by which we see the will is a faculty by which we choose the will is ordained towards the good 
and we're obliged to make choices of particular goods in light of our ultimate good. And yet, the will is not the only part of the human soul. We have an intellect. And so, of course, the intellect and will both are in the human soul. And the intellect is made to know what is true. And as you saw with Father Wiseman, and we mentioned, truth is the conformity of my mind to reality. So I fill my mind with reality. I conform my mind to reality. And that's what the speculative intellect does. But once we have the truth in our speculative intellect, the practical intellect presents that truth to the will under the aspect of good. And then the will, by its nature, seeks after the, the truth presented as a good, which means presented as perfective to the will, and the will is meant to pursue it. And yet in this state in which we are, we are imperfect. We have not reached our final end. We have this radical ability to fail as Adam and Eve failed in their test. And even more so now, we have wounds. The intellect is now blinded in finding the truth. The will now has this malice by which is just movement to choose apparent goods over the ultimate good. The concupiscence and the irascibility, the lower nature, pushes up against the will, influencing it to choose apparent goods. And so because of our imperfection, being in the state of travelers still, we're not, we don't yet have our ultimate end possessed, on account of the fact that we're wounded, it's very easy for us to have an, to err intellectually as what is true, or to choose an apparent good, which is truly an evil, instead of choosing, choosing the actual good. So that's why we're able to and often make the wrong choices. Sure. So to, so to recap, just make sure I understand, uh, understand this right. So we have our intellect and our will will always follow our intellect. Given the fact that our intellect has suffered from original sin, it's, it's damaged or somewhat mm -hmm. damaged, we could say. It's not perfect. It's like, uh, I don't know if I'm trying to uh, find my direction somewhere, but I have a faulty compass. My mm -hmm. compass would be like my intellect, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'm trying to follow it, mm -hmm. but because the compass is broken, I'm not going to quite go true north, even though I may want to do that um, because I have that faulty instrument, I'm mm -hmm. never going to quite hit that exact, or I may not hit that exact uh, proper yeah. destination. So our intellect is like that broken compass, and our will will follow the compass. Yep. Um, sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong, depending on, you know, external factors, but it's it's a, probably a poor analogy, but close-ish. No, it's true because we do compare law. The, I mean, the purpose of law is to guide the intellect in knowing what is true and by means of punishments and rewards, guide the will as regards what is good. So road signs, in fact, are used to help us understand what a law is meant to do. Law is meant to fill our intellect with the truth and coerce our will, influence our will, so we actually choose the truth presented by the intellect. So, so yes, because of our wounded human nature, we often, you know, go off track. We're not going due north when we're supposed to be due sure. north to heaven. We often fail in that. Sure. So, besides, so we that's our intellect. That's our that's our will in terms of our intellect. But we have liberty in other ways too. We have physical liberty to do things. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. We have what's known as quite simply the physical liberty, which is liberty from constraint. You know, we're not in prison. Um, you know, we're not, you know, in chains. So we have the physical ability to to walk about. And in fact, this, you know, physical ability, this liberty from any constraint, really is the foundation of the liberals' liberty. For them, they'll say, if we are able to do it, we should be allowed to do it. And later on, we'll show how the only thing which is going to restrict them from doing whatever they're physically permitted or physically able to do is the liberty of their neighbor as and their liberty of their neighbor as you know conceded in a, in a social contract which we'll, which we'll see later but physical liberty is just you know we're able to do it and they'll say then we should be able to do it we right. can do it we should be allowed to do it but as as catholics we know that just because we can doesn't mean we can <laughs> exactly no there's many things which we can do but They'll cost us our, our happiness on this life, our misery in this life, and they'll cost us certainly eternity in the next life. And, and so just that's, why this, that's why the church puts these restrictions on us. Yeah. And just because we're morally not able to, 
that doesn't mean that we that that's a violation of our of our liberty. In fact, it's not only not a violation of our liberty, but it's a perfection of our liberty. Okay. The moral law, in fact, perfects our liberty because, and as we mentioned last podcast, our faculty is for the sake of our end, which is happiness. So the purpose of our will is so that we reach our last end. And therefore, the moral law is meant to direct us to our last end, which means laws, just laws, make us more free. And because right. our nature is limited, and especially because it's fallen, we need just laws to direct the mind, and we need laws which coerce our wills to keep us on the right track, and this actually keeps us free. This, in right. fact, keeps us free. It keeps us happy, in fact. It's, it reminds me, when you were saying this, Father, it reminds me a lot of, um, you know, as, as being a parent, you know, you always hear, well, kids need structure. You know, children need structure in order to thrive and be happy. And if you just give them whatever they want, anytime they want, for the first few minutes, everything's great. But afterwards, it's it's Lord of the Flies. It's awful. Uh, and they're not happy. They they thrive under that structure and the schedule and that kind of stuff. And, and basically, growing up, as grown-ups, as adults, we are basically the same. We're not that different. Exactly. By just giving your child license to do whatever he wants there's certain instant gratification right but the faculties are not perfected the lower faculties are, are just you know are satiated but the intellect and will are not perfected and so that regularity that structure in fact makes the child happy and it's really key you know scripture says rarely does a young man you know differ or change from the ways of his youth his habits so the more we impose you know regulations and discipline on the child the more we perfect them and the happier, happier they'll certainly be. Absolutely. So the church, church defends that we have free will. Just to kind of recap a little bit, the church defends we have, that we have free will. It says, hey, it's, it's dangerous if you go against, if you abuse this free will. Uh, but then it also promotes the natural law. Is that right? Exactly. exactly. So she's an adamant defender of free will. She warns us. She sounds, you know, she sounds the alarm that you're wounded. Be very careful. Don't follow your lower passions. And then to keep us from just following our lower passions or following our intellect into error, then she defends the natural law. She brings us the divine law. She brings us church law. And she gives us, she coerces us by certain punishments just to make sure, hey, this is the way to happiness. So liberty is for the sake of an end. And the church wants us to reach our end. And therefore she gives us these road signs of the natural, the divine, the ecclesiastical law to help us reach our end. And the more we are seeking our end, the more free we are, the more happy we are. You know, God is the most free. He is the attitude. The saints in heaven, the angels are the next because they're united to him in a way, their end in a way which they can never lose it. Then the saints on this earth after that are the most free, which is why when you meet saintly people, they're the most happy. Sure. Because they're on the trajectory to the last end for which they are created. We are created by God for happiness. We are created by love. We are created to, to reach you know, the infinite charity of God. And the church, by giving us the moral law, puts us on the path to our last end. And, and even the, the philosophers, the ancient philosophers before the time of Christ, before you know, those who didn't even follow the Old Testament, the Jude Judaic law, uh, they, they recognize this as well, right? Exactly. They, for them, a man was truly free when he was wise. The wise man was one who saw things in light of the last end and had the virtues, prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. Those virtues by which the whole man is put in, in proper order. You know, the lower passions serve the higher faculties. The intellect is made to know the truth. So even the ancients realize that only the wise man is free and happy. And in fact, what do virtues do? But they free us from a slavery to sin. You know, our Lord says that he who, who sins is a slave to sin. Virtues and law, just laws, prevent us from being slaves to sin. But what about the ways in which we, we practice this free will? Does that matter? I mean, is it, is it enough just to, just to follow the law? Or and That kind of seems like, a, like an obvious point. But Leo XIII, he does talk about that, right? Yes, yes, he does. And just, you know, a few paragraphs later in the same encyclical, 
He tells us the manner in which such dignity, which is our free will, is exercised is of the greatest importance inasmuch as on the use of liberty, the highest good and the greatest evil alike depends. So how hmm. we use our free will brings the greatest good, ultimately heaven, or the greatest evil, ultimately our damnation. So that faculty must be properly used. So man is free, says the Pope, to obey reason, to seek the moral good, and to strive unswervingly after his end. Excellent. That gives him this great dignity. But he's also able to turn aside to other things, as we know, to a parent, to false goods. He can pursue the empty appearances of good, disturb the rightful order, and fall headlong into his destruction, which he has voluntarily chosen, says the Pope. And so, yes, our dignity is our our actual dignity is not just having free will, it's using free will to unswervingly seek the good. And the church is all about giving us that liberty, the liberty of the sons of God. And and kind of as an aside, if we compare the Catholic faith with Protestantism or you know Lutheranism, uh, where the actions just don't matter, um, we can see not only our ability to choose uh, choose the the proper ends the proper things, making our right decisions as good in and of themselves, but, you know, even struggling against them or working diligently towards these, these ends that may not be as attractive to us with our fallen nature, that can actually heap rewards on us as well. We can, we can merit from that, from fighting against the temptations and, or the, you know, our own, um, fallen nature. That's, that's beneficial to us as Catholics as well. Exactly. We see Job, he says, the life of man upon earth is warfare. So ever since original sin, there's a war. St. Paul says, the good that I will, I do not. The evil that I will not, I do. So we are in a war, and the church gives us the weapons to fight this war as happy soldiers. And because she, because she fills the mind with the truth, because we know where we're going, we're happy in the fight. And that's right. for, you mentioned educating children. If you just tell them what to do all the time, and they, they don't understand why, they will be miserable. They'll be slaves in a certain sense. But if their mind is filled with the truth as why they must do this, they recognize that life is a war. They recognize that we're fallen. They recognize there's an end. They recognize the means to get to that end. Then they'll be very happy, which why is important in the family or in society to always and only have just laws, which is something which is very much lost today because we have so many unjust laws in society in general. Sure. So to, to follow that point then, um, just laws, unjust laws, uh, it seems like we, we hear that bandied around all the time. Uh, well, that's unjust. That's, that's an unjust law. That's a just law. Um, is there some sort of a litmus test? Do the, do the Pope say anything about what makes a law just or unjust? Is it, does it benefit the common good or exactly. how do we define it? Yes. So Leo the Thirteenth does talk about it, but of course, St. Thomas long before. So a law is an ordinance of reason by the person who has care of the community for the sake of the common good. And it has to be promulgated so that people can know it. So it's an ordinance of reason, which means if it's an ordinance of reason, that law must correspond to the natural law and the eternal law. So all human law to be just must be a, a continuation, a clarification, a specification of the natural law, it must help put us in conformity with the eternal law and the divine law. And I can read you a quote from Leo the Thirteenth quoting St. Augustine okay. to help give us some more clarity there. Um, so it's in Libertas again, Pope Leo XIII tells us, St. Augustine most wisely says, I think that you can see at the same time that there is nothing just and lawful in that temporal law, unless what men have gathered from this eternal law. So that which is just in the temporal law must be gathered from the eternal law. And the Pope continues, if then by anyone in authority, something is sanctioned out of conformity with the principles of right reason and consequently hurtful to the common good, 
such an enactment can have no binding force of law as being no rule of justice, but is certain to lead men away from the good, which is the very end of civil society. So <laughs> if the law is opposed to right reason, so right, we say reason is right when reason is conformed to the natural law, which of course is part of the eternal law. So if the law is not conformed to right reason, it's not conformed to the eternal law, it's not leading man to his end, it's an unjust law. And St. Thomas Aquinas, as we know, is famous to say that an unjust law is no law. You can't have a, a law which leads us away from happiness, which is just. And so it's basically a contradiction in terms. There's really, in a sense, there's no such thing as an unjust law. It's just okay. not a law. Yeah. yeah. And unfortunately, there are cases where there may be unjust laws, but since they're not commanding us to do something directly against the natural law or divine law, prudence may require us to follow it. Okay. But it's a question of prudence, not a question of the fact it's a just law. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Um, so we've been given, uh, you've been giving us this, these definitions and these examples of what liberty is from, mm -hmm. you know, the definitions. Um, could we turn then to the liberal and then how do, how do they see this, this liberty? How do they see these, mm -hmm. these laws? Uh, do they just say, hey, let's break all the laws? Um, and maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here, but how, how does a liberal ent enter into this equation then? So as we mentioned, the liberal is rooted in naturalism. Okay. The naturalist rejects any dependence or consequential dependence on an extrinsic order of so God, who gives us divine law, which imposes sanctions. And so the liberal then takes this liberty from any external order and applies it to the moral order and to the political order. And so if one does not accept that there is this higher order, which we depend upon, which we can know with our reason, then there's no way that he's going to have to submit himself to this extrinsic divine, natural or ecclesiastical law. The only reason, and of course, there's different grades of liberalism, but for the most part, the liberal is going to obey laws based off utility, based off utility or some type of agreement, what we call the social contract, as we'll see later. We all chose to relinquish certain liberties to have certain peace. Okay. So, so, so for, for the liberal, the fundamental principle by which all things are judged or organized are his freedom from constraint, physical or moral. Nobody's going to tell me what to do, what to wear, where to go. You know, I might relinquish some of my rights, then I'll do it. But I'm not accepting that God or the church or the state are telling me. I'm accepting to do it because I relinquish my rights for the sake of utility, to, for the sake to live in peace with my common mankind. Okay. So then this, this kind of thinking, this, this, fundamental principle of just straight up freedom, mm -hmm. that that's going to flow directly into liberal philosophy, liberal ideas about religion, liberal politics, etc. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So for, for example, the, the liberal philosopher, the human mind is the measure of all things. Mm. So the human mind is not measured by God's mind. And therefore, the human mind does not have to seek to conform itself to God's mind through the natural order and the natural law, but the human mind is the measure of all things. I will choose what is true for me, which of course, as we know, Immanuel Kant is largely responsible for that. I'll choose what's true for me, you choose what's true for you. Mm -hmm. And so in philosophy, you can have as many philosophies as people because we, are, we can all choose what's true for us. And that brings us right to religion. What did Luther do? But he chose based off preference based off what seemed best for his, his current situation, what was true for him in the religious world. And so liberalism in religion is the doctrine that there's no, there's no positive truth in religion. One creed is as good as another. Revealed religion is not an absolute truth. It's a sentiment, it's a taste, it can change. Of course, the liberal is a rationalist, so they reject miracles. And then... Basically, whatever truth strikes my fancy, makes me happy, that's the religious truth I follow. And that's why you see countless Protestant groups 
I mean, there's over 30,000 Protestant groups and how people indiscriminately change from one to another because this one doesn't make me feel good anymore. You know, it's your religion, my religion. It's all a question of preference. I'm going to change religions. So it's really a disconnect from, from an objective order. Right. And even, and even in, in terms of the same, same religious sect or the same denomination, they'll go, well, I, I prefer this pastor over this pastor. He makes me feel a little bit better or not. And that's why, yeah. that's why the church has always been a little bit cautious about that. Don't just, don't get too attached to one priest. You know, if, if you're in Calgary and you really love Father Reuter, watch out because he's going to be transferred. You know, don't, yeah. don't do that. Don't get so attached yeah. because it's, it's not, not about the man. It's in the church. It's, no, it's, we have the creed. We have the dogmas. As long as and we have morality, so if the, if the priest is teaching the faith and living morally, that's, we have the essence. Right. Whereas the Protestant groups have these boards which interview and elect and fire their pastors based off whether or not he corresponds to the you know the needs, sure, the evolving needs of the congregation. Sure. That can't and shouldn't happen in the church. Right. So that's philosophy and religion, and then. This, this freedom, this is going to flow directly into politics as well. We're going to see this. I mean, we see this all the time today. We're, we're living through it. Yeah, exactly. So the doctrine, it attempts to reduce to a minimum any social authority. Mm -hmm. So the authority of the state, the authority you know, of the law enforcement, that's meant to be as minimalistic as possible, which also we can see, as, again, is rooted in that denial of original sin. That denial of the fact that we need to be you know, coerced. There needs to be punishments if we break the law. Otherwise, you know, there's no consequences. It will spiral downward. Now, of course, St. Thomas is very clear that if the authority spent more time promoting virtue, she would need to spend less time enforcing laws. Right. So the more we promote virtue, the less we need the police, so to speak. Right. Because by, like the ancients said, only the virtuous man is a free man. And so if we're promoting prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude, there'd be much less crime. But even if we had the ideal legislative branch of the government, and even if the laws reflected the natural law, we can't get away from the fact that man is wounded, and therefore we do need authority, which has a fairly strong arm, to enforce laws. And that authority does not come from the people. It comes from God. Right. St. Paul says, you know, the, the authority holds the sword, and that sword comes from God to punish the evil. Right. And that's something which the liberals reject, the idea that the, the authority of the state over whether it be life or death or any coercion comes from God and is for the sake of the common good. So without any, any sort of ideal or idea of the divine authority in the state, um, there is what, what you basically have is this boundless um, free will or this boundless license. Uh, for man to do yeah. what he wants. Exactly. It's, you know, my liberty stops where your liberty starts. Mm -hmm. That's determined by, you know, an agreement we all came together and decided, well, here's the parameters of our liberty. Um, you know, the social contract theorists don't really s have a way out of that, but they seem to agree that once you're in that social contract, you can't get out. But, but why? I don't know, because if you made the contract, you can break the contract. Which, in fact, is why, you know, one government gives way to another or there's these countless revolutions, because if the leader of the country reports only the people, not to God, and the people, they make him, then they think they break him. Right. Whereas it's fine to have a democratic system of voting. Of course, we vote, we encourage it. It's very important. But once we cast our vote, it's God who gives the authority. Mm -hmm. And then the leader, there are checks and balances, but the leader is going to stand before our Lord one day. How did you exercise your authority? Did you enact laws? for the sake of the common good, in light of men's last end, which means supporting ultimately the Catholic Church as the only true church. So for, for the liberal, it's it's all about individual conscience. It's whatever, if it bothers you, then it's probably wrong. If it doesn't bother you, go do it. And who am I to judge? Whoops. Exactly. Every, yeah, that's really it. That's We only got to that because of centuries of liberalism. Who am I to judge what you do? Well, well I can't judge your intention, but right. I can say that action is intrinsically disordered. And therefore, I am judging that right. action is being intrinsically disordered. And I'm judging the fact that if someone doesn't convert from that, they'll be lost. Our Lord was very clear about that. But yes, for the liberal, every man's individual conscience is really supreme. Hmm. He makes his rule of life based off his conscience, his conscience, which 
is not informed by an objective order, but which flows from his, you know, his consciousness, his desires, his 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 um his wishes. And that is the supreme rule for him. If it makes him feel good, if nobody's hurt by it, it's his guide. And then they take this and they apply it to public affairs as well. You know, in the democratic system, well, the you know the supremacy of the greatest number. If you know 51% of people vote that you can kill babies, it's the law and it's good because that's the collective conscience that's spoken. We can't speak against that. Which, so to have such a thought shows that we've totally cut ourselves off from reality. Right now, it's positive law, the law posited by the authority as expressed by the will of people becomes the sovereign and only law. And there's no recourse to a higher law. Um, and that's destructive because we're afloat. And this is maybe getting into mass. I'm sorry. We're at the whims of the mass in that case, the mass of people. Yeah, I was going to say this is maybe getting into a bit of psychology here. But I think uh, as you're talking about all this, I'm thinking you know, we're living in, in 2020, you know, gearing up towards 2021, which who knows mm -hmm. what's going to happen. Um, but, there's, but there's been chaos. There's been riots, chaos, destruction, looting. Um, mm -hmm. And t it seems to me, again, my opinion, that a lot of this, this anger, this, this chaos is happening because, well, laws that are passed are really only from, at least here in the States, you know, 51%. We're, we're a very divided country. 50% believe this, 50% believe this. And so this, by the slim majority, you know, abortion is legal or by the slim majority death penalty or not, you know, whatever the case may be. And since there's no real basis in an objective truth, people mm -hmm. are just angry because, well, there's, there's, there's nothing that, at least when, when we as Catholics are told, you may not do this, it's wrong, or it's not the law, we go, oh, okay, well, there's a higher authority, we understand. But for many people, there is, there's not that. It's just, oh, the whims of the people, and you yes. lose. <laughs> and you notice how the anger is really on the side of the left, of the revolutionaries. And it's because, as every revolution, the idea of revolution, going back from Lucifer to today, is cast off all and any order which comes from a higher power. Mm -hmm. and so the... You know, the progressivists constantly push for more radical laws, more liberty, and it's ultimately man playing God. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, liberalism is that, is man's liberated from the order of God. He creates his own order. If I'm the creator of my own order, I'm God. And so anybody who tries to ratchet that back says, no, you can't just murder babies, you know, up through nine months. Well, you're restricting my liberty. Who mm -hmm. are you to say that I don't have this power over you know, my body. But part of the problem also, though, of course, as we mentioned in the first series, is most conservatives today, they don't promote these laws based off the natural law or the divine law. They base it purely off positive law. Right. So they're not rooting it in, you know, the divine law. Thou shalt not kill. This is a person. Um, even the abortion, you know, industry and fighting against it, even the pro-lifers will say, well, that, that child has the right to live. Okay, well, it's true, but the fundamental problem is God has the right over life and death, and nobody right. has the right to take that life because God alone is the master of life and death. So the conservatives constantly try to rein in the liberals, but using purely positive law, the liberals are enraged against the law of God. The consequence is what we see, which is chaos. Yeah, if, if you play the liberal game, you'll lose every time. It's, exactly. it's like the it, thing is service or playing the liberal game. It's like that that old movie. I, I forget the title of it now, but the only way to win is to not play the game at all. I mean, you'll you'll lose. Then says something similar. He says, "Never participate in the lie. Mm -hmm. Never participate in the lie." He said that in regards to the communist revolution. Is once you participate in the lie, it's tough to get out of it. and It's tough to win. Right. Now that being said, you know, the politics, the possible requires us to do whatever we can to ratchet back. You know the evils, but we can't participate in the lie, which is tough today because we live in the liberal illusion, a great lie. But you, you mentioned the rights of your neighbor. Really, the only rights come to us from God. The exactly. if 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 someone, if the government, say the United States government says, "All right, this is now a right that you have," is that really a right, or is that just an arbitrary thing? 
Well, there are different, there are natural rights which come immediately from God. Then the state can confer, and she does confer, certain rights on her citizens. And those do come from God to the extent that they're justly conferred by the state, and the state is an instrument of God. But if the state does confer on her citizens certain privileges, which non-citizens don't have, mm -hmm. that's good from God as well. Right. So the, the right to be able to the right to be able to travel if I have a passport or something, that's a that's a good right. It's not necessarily a divine right, but it's it no, comes no, no. in it comes from the fact I am a citizen of this country. These are the different alliances between countries. As long as I, you know, obey the laws of my country in these countries, then I can travel, no problem. And that it comes from God. It does come from God. Okay. But um, it's every, but every right implies a duty. Uh huh. So if we're given a right, it's in order to fulfill a duty. So every every right has a corresponding duty. So we can't just say, you know, I have the right to do whatever I want. No, you have the right to do this because you have a duty to reach this end. Okay. So all of our rights have to be seen in light of our duties imposed on our nature by God or our country. Our country gives us certain rights and privileges, likewise certain duties to live according to the laws of our country. Okay. And that's what we say is, you know, the, the state is the arm of God. She has the, she has the ability to act in God's name and to, to confer different positive law rights to us in exchange for the duties that we do. Okay. That makes sense. We've talked about Pope Leo the Thirteenth. Um, are there any other other people that we should know about who have talked about liberalism? I mean, Archbishop Lefebvre. We talked about him uh, last episode. Obviously, spoke out very, very much about liberalism. Yes. But is there anyone else? We'll speak about Cardinal. I think P a bit more next time. Okay. But really, a, a important figure is, is, is Cardinal Bilot. He was a great Catholic theologian, Frenchman, made cardinal by Pope. St. Pius X. And in fact, he helped draft the encyclical Pascendi. Mm. At a cardinal by Pope Pius X, helped draft Pascendi, and in fact resigned, which is unusual, but resigned his position as cardinal under Pope Pius XI. Mm. And before he resigned, Pope Pius XI, as we know, Vatican I was interrupted before it finished, and Pius XI asked the cardinals whether they should reconvene the council, whether they should have an ecumenical council to to consider the modern errors. And the response of Cardinal Bilot is very, very impressive and very insightful. And he responded to this question of Pius XI, should we have an ecumenical council? The Cardinal responded that because of their dangers and difficulties, so because of the dangers and difficulties of an ecumenical council, the era of ecumenical council seems to have ended definitively. Hmm. This is especially the danger that the modernist would take advantage of the council to make a revolution, a new 1789, which is the object of their hopes and dreams. So here we are in the 1920s, just and this kind of introduces wow. the next idea of liberal Catholicism. Here we are in the 20s, and a great Catholic cardinal who helped draft Pascendi is saying, the era of ecumenical council seems to be over because the modernist, the liberal Catholics, are entrenched in the church, and they want to take the French Revolution, which is the great victory of liberalism, and bring it into the Catholic Church. Was he saying that it would be dangerous to do a new ecumenical council, or that a council, if it was formed would not be seen as ecumenical. There, see the distinction I'm trying to make there? I, yeah, you really thought it, it in itself it would be danger. Okay. Dangerous because of the liberal hierarchy. Okay. So okay. many liberals had infiltrated the hierarchy. Their goal was to make the principles of liberalism and the French Revolution reign in the church. Is if we have this gathering of all the bishops of the world, we won't be able to stop the tide of this, this liberal agenda in the church. Wow. So he's a big figure for that reason. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. I'd, I'd not heard of him before chatting with you about him today. That's that's great. So so did he resign because of this conflict of having the continuing on the, the council or? No, Pius XI did not push forward with the council, but he did have a, there was a lot of tension and pressure because Pope Pius XI suppressed, or at least in the wake of him suppressing Action Francaise, a French political movement, which was very much fighting against the liberal ideals of the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. So here we're not 
trying to canonize that movement, but certainly there was very good things in that movement. Um, and Father Lafloc supported it. We know Father Lafloc was the seminary rector, I think, for 23 years, and he influenced Archbishop Lefebvre and made him this great Catholic and therefore anti-liberal prelate who had a great role to play in, in helping the church through the crisis and continues to help the church today. So Father Lafloc was a friend of Cardinal Bilot. They're both great theologians. And the Cardinal resigned after Pius XI suppressed condemned action Francaise. For him, this movement which is fighting for Christ's kingship against the liberalism of the French Revolution was not to be suppressed. And so, you, and you can see here, you know, the human element of the church. Pius XI wrote an encyclical defending Christ's kingship in a great encyclical, which we reference, we preach about, we use as really the, the synthesis of Catholic doctrine and Christ's kingship. Right. Yet in the practical sphere, the implementation of these principles, Pius XI seems to have got it wrong, and seems clearly that he got it wrong. And he's a, still a good pope, for sure. sure. And you can see a cardinal objecting to this and resigning because of it. And in fact, three days after the cardinal resigned, Father Lafloc, after 23 years, resigned his position as seminary rector. And it seems there was a lot wow. of influence there as well from um, the enemies of the church to get Father Lafloc out. Because if you form good priest, you'll have a holy church. If the priests are poorly formed, if they're liberal, as Father Lafloc said, the church will be in very bad shape. Wow, that must have been an interesting time to be in Rome, <laughs> to put it mildly. Yeah, and we, were, in fact, it's we always often think about, you know, we're in this great crisis now, but things were so pleasant before. You know, in 1917, which was the anniversary of Freemasonry, there was all these revolutionaries and rioters marching through Rome, with images of you know Lucifer crushing Saint Michael. Wow. And saying that we're gonna, you know, we're gonna reign. Satan's gonna reign in the church through the papacy. So these revolutions throughout history are nothing new, right. and it's just a perpetual conflict between, you know, the good and the evil. And we have, you know, the great grace to, to work, you know, for the sake of the light and truth, as did Father Lafloc and, and these cardinals before. And we, as Catholics with tradition, need to constantly seek to live up to those ideals. It's it's quite a legacy which they've passed to us, which we could easily betray ourselves. Right. Great men have fallen. Yeah. Well, that's that's the kind of the background of, of Cardinal Bilo. Um, so what is it that he really has to teach us about, about liberalism? There's an excellent quote here. He tells us, liberalism is a doctrine which emancipates man from God. So he calls it a doctrine mm. which emancipates man from God, his law, and his revelation. So thanks to these different... Um, elements of liberalism. He's liberated from God, God's law, and God's revelation. And he continues, and civil society is liberated from any dependence regarding religious society. It's absolute separation of church and state. So this separation of church and state, and the church is the guardian of the divine law. So see that for the liberal, the, the divine law, which is meant to permeate and help the state is is now pushed aside and the state is free as we'll see later you know the free church in a free state with no interplay with no indirect um, power one over the other wow so he's he's a, a big figure a huge figure in, in this study of, of liberalism yes yes wow. and just one century ago he was walking right the face of this earth and teaching and, and fighting for christ the king which yeah. we all hope to follow absolutely well, that um, we're, we've kind of gotten to our time limit for for okay. today. Um, but looking ahead towards uh, towards next week, um, what are we going to be covering then, Father? So we'll just give a little more clarification on what it means to be Catholic. Okay. There is a lot of confusion today. What it means to be Catholic in this in this world. So we'll give a few definitions, define what it means to be Catholic. Then once we do that, we should immediately see the contradiction between liberalism and Catholicism. And if there is such a violent contradiction, we ask ourselves, what allowed liberalism to so infect the church? So we'll look at some historical events which allowed liberalism to, to influence and enter the church, which brings about the modernist crisis of today. Okay, perfect. Well, Father, until next time, thank you. Oh, we appreciate your time. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate it. All right. 
Thank you for listening to and watching episode five of our Crisis in the Church series here on the SSPX podcast. This coming Thursday, we'll continue with Father Reuter as we explore the upsurge in Catholic liberalism and why that's a contradiction in terms. If you have a question on the topic of the crisis, please feel free to ask it at sspxpodcast.com slash crisis, and we'll do our best to have it answered during the appropriate episode. And we could definitely use your support. Please share this episode with someone who you think might enjoy it. And if they don't know what a podcast is, please show them so that they can take advantage of all our episodes. And if you have the ability to set up a monthly recurring donation of $5, 10 or $20 on sspxpodcast.com, it would help us immensely to complete this Crisis in the Church project. Until next week, thank you for listening, and God bless you.